third day of the Nordic Summer School. Welcome everyone, good evening. And it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Maria Christina uh, to this summer school. We have had two excellent days and I'm sure this third day is going to be very interesting. We have very interesting topics which are being covered. And uh, Professor Christina is going to talk to us about teacher training and education in Finland. And from the outset, we have been discussing how the Nordics are a model you know, they're the perfect societies, so to say. So they are a mod they are model, they're super model because of the uh, uh, various parameters on which you can measure performance on almost all indicators. They are, they are on the top of, um, you know, the, uh, top on, they're, the, they're basically the front rankers, the for forerunners of everything and including education. So if we look at the 2021, I was just looking at some of the recent reports and the 2021 uh, world best education ratings and the rankings which have come out for the first quarter. In that, I see that Finland is occupies the first position followed by Denmark. So uh, this is at the right time to actually talk of this, of uh, how they are managing their education so well. Because here uh, at uh, our end, we are also trying to uh, revisit, reformulate uh, how we are, uh, you know, imparting education, uh, looking at the both infrastructure problems and learning outcomes and objectives, how to achieve the best possible. Uh, uh, you know, actually, Delhi's deputy chief minister had visited. Uh, Finland to study the Finnish model of education and one thing which he actually came up with and he observed there and which he actually shared in his interviews was about teacher training and he said that this is something which is uh, which we need to look at here in India because that is the that is the basis the foundation of how you can impart good good education so I think this is a very good uh, you know, I, we haven't really had much exposure on this other than, you know, in knowing that this is that they're uh, doing well on education and that the education models are good. Uh, so we, we would love to hear from you how, what are, what could be the possible takeaways for us. Thank you for being with us today and welcome once again. Over to you now. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much uh, for your kind invitation. Uh, Professor, I'd just like to briefly introduce you to our audience. Yes. And uh, so we have with us today, Professor Maria Christina Lerkanen. Uh, professor Lerkanen cur currently works as a professor at the Department of Teacher Education in the University of uh, Yuvashkula in Finland, as well as uh, a professor at the University of Stavanger in Norway. Uh, Professor Lekaren does research in educational psychology, reading, motivation, primary education, and preschool education. The previous project was the CARE project, which continues currently as Quality Matters. Her current projects are First Step Study, Teacher Stress Study, and Two Teachers in a Classroom. Professor, the stage is now yours. Thank you for the introduction. So thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, so I have uh, about 45 minutes. Uh, and if you have any questions, so please uh, just uh, uh, join, join this uh, session as well. I'm going to talk about the teacher training and education in Finland in my, in my lecture. And uh, first, I would like to show you uh, the map of the Nordic countries and uh, you see Finland there uh, beside of Sweden. Uh, Yuvaskula is the uh, city where I'm from and our University of Yuvaskula is located uh, quite south part of Finland, uh, 300 kilometers from Helsinki, which is, the, which is the capital of Finland. Right now we have a spring here, but <laughs> as you see, uh, we have a, um, uh, the birds uh, has arrived here, but the, the lakes are still frozen. So, so the birds are then uh, are just uh, uh, stepping uh, on the top of the lake uh, on, on the ice. But uh, I hope that very soon uh, the warm spring will, will come and uh, uh, the lakes, the thousands of lakes we have here, here in south part of Finland uh, will be unfrozen and swelled. Okay, um, 
Maybe you are aware that Finland has been successful in many international studies during last 25 years, and that has raised uh, the interest to Finnish education uh, all around the world. So um, these are some examples of those uh, OECD or international surveys where we have been very successful. Pearls uh, concerning 10 year uh, 10 year old uh, students, PISA, which is the most uh, uh, known one, is concerns 15 years old, and PIAC is about adults' uh, day skills. Uh, as you might be aware, PISA is uh, uh, assessing uh, student uh, skills in literacy, math, science, and nowadays also ICT and some other, other issues. And we have been uh, quite many years, we were number one in, uh, in this uh, survey, and uh, we still are among the five best, uh, depending on the year and depending on the subject area where we uh, has been assessed. So of course, uh, it has raised the interest that how we do that. And um, here you can see the education system in Finland in that this figure. Uh, so from zero to six years old, we have early child education and care. Uh, and uh, one year before uh, the basic education will start, we have a pre-primary education uh, for six year old children. Uh, the location is mostly in daycare centers for pre-primary classrooms, uh, but about 20% are located in schools. And nowadays there is a big reform concerning the pre-primary education and next uh, fall actually we start to pilot the two years pre-primary education so that the, in the future it will start uh, when the children are five years old. So two years in pre-primary before they go to the school to comprehensive education. Uh, the basic education comprehensive schools are divided to two levels, primary uh, from first to sixth grade. So when, uh, they are, when children are seven years old, they start their comprehensive uh, school. And uh, when they are 12, they go to lower secondary. And uh, when they are 15, 16, uh, they end the comprehensive school and all children uh, go uh, to the upper secondary school education for three years. Uh, but there they can uh, choose uh, two different kind of tracks, uh, more vocational qualification track or uh, more general uh, education uh, track, more academic education track. And in academic uh, track, there is a matriculation examination in the end of, uh, of upper secondary school. Uh, it used to be so that it was only possible, possible to continue to university level education if you uh, uh, choose this academic track. But nowadays it's also possible uh, to go forward in your uh, studies in the vocational track. And after that, um, there is uh, university uh, studies and uh, the universities of applied sciences which are available uh, uh, to the students for three or five years uh, uh, studies and then uh, from from the university degree you can continue to the doctoral degrees uh, uh, which is usually four or five years what is special in finnish education is that everything is free of charge so our also the doctoral level studies. So from the bottom to to the uh, to the uh, to the end, the only uh, exception is early childhood education uh, for uh, from for zero to uh, five years old children, uh, where parents pay a fee, but it's very very low, and it depends on the parents. Uh, uh, economical situation for some families is also free. So we have public school system and only about 1.5% are private schools uh, 
and they usually have some uh, kind of philosophy background like Montessori, Steiner or, or something very special uh, issue. Uh, as I, I said that there's nine years basic education which begins at age seven, which is quite late compared to many, many other countries, most of the countries I would say. Yeah. Um, also in Estonia, our neighbor, neighborhood, uh, neighboring neighborhood country, they start also school at the age of seven. Um, uh, it's very important that we uh, offer equal educational opportunities to everyone, uh, irrespective of domicile, gender, financial situation, or linguistic or cultural background. We have two official languages in Finland, the Finnish and 6% of population are Swedish speaking population. Uh, so we have most of the schools are Finnish speaking schools, but uh, especially in the West Coast beside uh, Sweden, uh, we have a uh, Swedish speaking schools and also in capital area in Helsinki, they are Swedish speaking schools. Parents do not select the schools for their child because uh, there's hardly any differences in the level of education between the schools. So usually uh, the children go to school in their neighborhood and the schools are located quite, uh, quite close uh, uh, to the families. Uh, schools do not test or select pupils uh, to the schools. Uh, uh, we use, uh, used to say that the schools need to be ready for every child not the opposite way that the child needs to be ready for the school. But the school has to be ready to take every child to the school. So what are the possible factors of Finnish success in those uh, um, so international surveys? Europe Commission has listed some uh, ideas about that. And I think there is no simple answer or uh, which will solve all the problems uh, or is the way for the success. I think the first, first thing is about the Finnish society where we appreciate education and uh, trust, uh, we trust highly educated teachers. So um, education has been the way to uh, go up in, in the social hierarchy. And uh, it's still a uh, thought that uh, through education, you'll get a, a better uh, uh, opportunities in society and, and uh, it's a way to for a good life. So education is much appreciated. And it uh, can be seen also in our uh, politic, uh, in, in the politics. Uh, so investment in education is among the biggest in the world. Uh, around 6%. Uh, basic education is completely free of charge, so all learning materials, lunch for all children, and, and so on. Um, what is quite uh, interesting is that Finland has compra comparatively low teaching time, uh, so um, the school days are not very long. Um, but um, people who has visited us from abroad and visited the schools and follow the lessons, they say that uh, that teaching times is used effectively. And, and uh, it's only possible, possible because uh, during the school day, there is 15, 30 minute breaks where children go outside after each 45 minutes. So they play outside, they come into the classroom again and they start to study again. And then uh, after 45 minutes, they go outside again. And uh, as you know, we are very north here. So we have quite long winter and uh, it's, it can be very cold sometimes. And we used to say here that there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing. And uh, uh, children love to go outside to play, uh, play there. And uh, where they, are, um, they are very energized, uh, of course. And when they come back, uh, they can concentrate to their learning again. So teachers uh, uh, plan very uh, effective way uh, the teaching time in the, inside the classroom. Um, 
assessment of both schools learning outcomes and students uh, in is encouraging and supportive in nature and the aim is to produce information that will help schools uh, develop the pedagogy and students uh, so uh, we don't have any list of uh, the schools assessment student assessment or we don't uh, make any rankings uh, uh, between the schools uh, uh, so it's uh, it's more like that uh, the purpose of assessment is to develop what we are doing. So it's part of uh, the school development and uh, teachers pedagogical development work. And also, of course, we feed back to the students and parents that the, where the students skills development is uh, uh, going and uh, uh, is there some support need, needed or uh, or how how things are going so that is a little bit different way of uh, uh, thinking about the assessment and evaluation than in many other countries there's almost no national testing an exception uh, are grade nine so the final year of comprehensive school and grade uh, 12 matriculation uh, which is after 12 years education Plenty of attention is focused on individual support for pupils learning and well being, so we um, believe that the early recognition and interventions for children at risk are the most beneficial one. So we try to be one step ahead and try to identify children who need uh, special support in their learning or well being uh, as early as possible that we can uh, we can help uh, them in the schools we have the inclusive uh, school policy here but uh, it's sort of a dual system that, that we still have some special schools for example for deaf uh, children or blind children and uh, and some some other but uh, there's only few of them uh, most of the students are integrated in the normal classrooms or there can be uh, small groups in 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 uh, in the big schools uh, uh, for for children with special needs. But usually, those uh, small groups are for children with learning difficulties, for example, dyslexia or um, difficulties in mathematics. So, so uh, the idea is that in small group, uh, uh, it's uh, much more effective to them. Um, uh, to develop their skills and they get more support for their learning in small group than in big classrooms. The average, average size of the classrooms is about 20 children. Uh, it's about, uh, so in the first and second grade, uh, the average is 18, but uh, with the, uh, the older uh, children, it can be 25 or, or, or even uh, 30, but uh, uh, but the average is around 2021. Many people uh, are asking about the national uh, curriculum. So we have this uh, uh, national curriculum, uh, which I have been uh, participated to do that, but it's uh, more like a guidelines for the municipalities and schools because each municipality, uh, they uh, make their own curriculum based on this national core curriculum. And in the schools, they can still make some changes concerning the area where the school is or the special focus uh, of the school. Here is the four uh, uh, main point of, of the national curriculum. So the emphasis is student-centered teaching and learning. Uh, which means that uh, the emphasis in, in the teaching is interaction and student experiences and uh, uh, taking care of the uh, student interest areas and use those interests uh, when you are planning uh, your teaching and, and your classroom activities. Uh, you put a specific focus uh, to keep the motivation and engagement in the learning situations, uh, because uh, we know from the studies that if the motivation and engagement is in high level, then uh, the outcomes uh, uh, 
will come after that. Uh, so we are not only focusing on the skill development or teaching some skill or some content, uh, but uh, uh, we, we sort of think that uh, uh, raising up the motivation and interest of the children to certain uh, aspects or ideas or skills, uh, uh, their skill, skills uh, and knowledge will develop more e e e efficient way. Uh, the, uh, the second issue is to enhance students' participation and agency in learning situation, uh, which increase the meaningfulness of study and also in, it supports the engagement and motivation again. And this makes it possible uh, for each and everyone to experience success. So we sort of uh, uh, think that each child has uh, their own potential and we as an educator need to see that potential of the child and support that potential they had they have uh, the students are involved uh, setting goals uh, solve problems and assess their own learning based on set targets yeah, all the targets comes uh, together with the, along with the national curriculum uh, the students uh, uh, will be involved in negotiating that how to reach the goals and which are uh, the, the goals, how far they want to go and uh, how to solve the problems. And uh, they are also involved to assess their own learning and, and follow their learning processes to find out that how to improve their, for example, learning strategies and uh, the way they are studying. Then the fourth point is the individual learning approaches. So um, the teachers need to adapt their teaching uh, according to individual needs of each children in the classroom. So um, uh, we, we talk about the, how the uh, different, how they use the differentiation, how to individualize uh, the learning situations, how to give the targeted support of, uh, to each student and uh, how, how to do that in a uh, big group in the whole classroom level and also in individual level. Uh, the teachers find uh, this part the most challenging one, of course, because there's many children and if there is many challenges in the classroom and each child has their own uh, needs, uh, of course, uh, for one adult, it's, it's a challenging, challenging uh, job to do. But the teachers have been very successful to find the ways how to do that. And nowadays, there are quite a lot of team teaching also that they, uh, some part of the school day, there can be two teachers in the classroom. Uh, or the teachers put the two classrooms together and then there's two adults or even if there's special education teacher also with them, there's three uh, adults and it might be that they have resources for teaching assistant as well uh, to work with them. So then there's more adults uh, to support the children's learning. But uh, always uh, the main teacher is responsible about uh, the planning, uh, the lesson and planning, uh, the whole uh, whole teaching and what kind of pedagogy to use. So the other teachers are working uh, as a co-teachers if they are uh, helping or supporting at the main teacher. So there we go to the teachers then. And uh, as you remember in OECD, in the Europe Commission report that uh, where the highly trained teachers is one key for the success. So uh, we uh, have the master degree in education at the elementary level, and it's still international quite rare that the primary school teacher or elementary school teachers, they have the master degree from the university program. Um, what is unique also, the teaching profession is highly respected and very popular among uh, young, young people. And this makes it possible for us as a teacher trainee, trainers to select the very best students to teach uh, the teacher training programs. 
annually there are tenfold more applying for training than there is the possibility to accept in. And for example, in Uvascular University, uh, 2017, there was uh, 1,500 applicants, and we accept 90 uh, every year to the program. Um, what is also unique is that we have research-based teacher education. So the teacher training programs are research-informed. So uh, the teacher training institutions in the universities uh, uh, do a lot of research. Uh, they are working researchers, professors, and, uh, and uh, all the staff members are involved with the research uh, one or, or the other way. And also our students, uh, student teachers, they are involved uh, to, to the research project in, in some ways and the master thesis are usually linked to research uh, programs or research projects. Uh, Finnish teachers have a strong autonomy and pedagogical freedom to implement the curriculum and develop their pedagogical practices. But this is only possible because they are so well trained. Uh, if the training is very low level and the teacher skills are very low, this does not work so, so well. Uh, we have heard uh, uh, some examples from abroad that, uh, where they thought that, okay, this is uh, the key for the success. Okay, we give the autonomy to the teachers to do what they want. And that is not the case. Uh, that is not the way for the success and there has been a very big problems in some countries doing that without not training the teachers probably properly so uh, i think that behind this strong autonomy is uh, the good education of teachers teachers are very strongly committed to their work there is hardly no uh, uh, changes uh, from teachers profession to other professions and they educate themselves uh, during their career all, all the time. So a uh, little bit about the teacher training then. So the teacher qualifications in Finland, in daycare centers uh, for the youngest children, you have to be kindergarten teacher. And this is parcels degree, so three years education. For preschool, for six years old children, uh, kindergarten teacher uh, with a, a master's degree or class teacher with a master master degree. But nowadays, uh, even it's possible that the kindergarten teacher uh, with the master's le level will will uh, work well uh, in the preschool. Um, they usually have also the master. Uh, master degree. In comprehensive school, in a primary level, there's uh, class teachers and in lower secondary, as well as upper secondary school, there are subject teachers. And in upper secondary vocational education, there are subject, subject teachers and vocational teachers. There is very shortly, uh, in the nutshell, that teacher education degree programs so the, the qualification studies uh, and the other programs. So the students can apply uh, to, to the teacher education degree program. And there's three first other examples of that, early childhood education and pre-primary teacher, special education teacher and primary school class teacher education. Qualification studies mean that you have some other uh, education already already and uh, uh, then you can uh, come to the teacher training uh, to find uh, um, more qualification to act as a teacher. So doing the teacher pedagogical studies for subject teachers, master programs in study guidance and school counseling or qualification in that area, adult educators pedagogical studies and also principal uh, preparation program and advanced leadership program. And then there is also other programs uh, which don't give the teacher qualification, but are 
uh, in this area. So uh, adult education and educational sciences. And we have also international master's degree program in educational sciences. And by the way, from India, we, uh, every year we have students in this international master degree program. For example, I have in my doctoral school uh, two students uh, from, from India. They are very, very good. So uh, primary school teachers uh, program, um, here are the list of the studies they do, language and communication, basic studies in education, intermediate studies in education and advanced studies. And then these multidisciplinary school subject studies means that they study all the school subjects they need to teach at school. And the minor subject studies mean that they choose two subjects where they specialize. They will specialize in that. So it's five year studies. These are the list of these multidisciplinary school subject studies. Uh, basically, there is all, uh, all the subjects in, in primary school. And every year they have teaching practice and each teaching practice they are doing uh, in teacher training school, which is located in the university area. Pedagogical qualification studies for subject teachers means that uh, they do their studies uh, in that the department, the subject department, for example, for example, in the department of mathematics or department of physics or, or so on. And they come to study with us uh, for two years to do the pedagogical studies in teacher, uh, teacher training. Here are the six uh, teacher competencies in our institution. And each institution has their uh, own negotiator that which are the competencies they want uh, the student uh, have after uh, after their five year studies. So uh, in Yuvaskula, uh, we concentrate to ethical competencies, intellectual competence, communicative and interactional competence, which is very important nowadays in our studies, uh, cultural, community, and social competence, of course, pedagogical competence in every subject area, and then uh, ISD competence as well. I told earlier that uh, we have a um, theory-based and research-based teacher education. And here are some of the theoretical background in our teacher training program. Uh, so the first is the developmental uh, system theory by Bronkenbrenner. Uh, and it means that the daily teacher child interaction and teaching practices are uh, as continuous exchanges between teacher and, and children. And uh, that interaction is a central driver uh, for child's learning and development. The same issues are listed in these effective teaching principles, how the supportive classroom climate and scaffolding a student's learning is important for success. And also what kind of teaching strategies uh, are found to be the most effective one. Then nowadays we talk a lot about education and dialogue and it's a deeper issue than just classroom talk. It's more like a, a dialogue uh, uh, whereby the teacher supports students' participation, meaning making and independent thinking through open question, inquiry and feedback and encourage them to explain their thinking. And uh, teachers think that is uh, quite challenging to do that, uh, but uh, they, at the same time, they think that it's very important for their deeper learning. We have done a lot of, uh, in, in the end of this uh, session, I want to talk uh, some words about the research we have done here. And it's about this classroom quality quite a lot nowadays. So we are, looking for that, uh, what, is, uh, what does it mean that the classroom has a high quality or low quality? There's a number of studies about the structural quality that uh, what the curriculum says, uh, who can teach and where the teaching 
is uh, done and what kind of material the teacher is uh, using. That has some effect to the student outcomes. But uh, from previous studies, we have seen that actually the process quality is the more important. And it means that how the teacher is implementing uh, the curriculum, for example, in the classroom. What kind of relationship the teacher has uh, with the children. Uh, what kind of academics and social interactions there is because it's affected the motivation and engagement of the students in, in, in the teaching uh, sessions. What kind of emotional support the teacher is giving in the classroom and how they organize, how they manage uh, the teaching time and how they support the uh, children's learning through instruction. Um, the studies have shown that the high emotional support, effective classroom management and high instructional quality um, is associated to social skills, academic achievement, motivation, uh, children's behavior uh, and engagement in the classroom. We have used, I don't know if maybe uh, some of you are familiar with this class instrument uh, by Bob Bianta and Bridget Hamry. And uh, this is one way to observe what is happening in the classroom and what is the qu process quality of the teaching. And there we can look at the three domains, the emotional support, classroom organization and instructional support. And below that are the dimensions uh, uh, for example, the climate, classroom climate, the teacher sensitivity, regards for students' perspective, behavioral management, productivity of the teaching, instruction and learning formats, uh, content development, quality of feedback and language modeling, and then the indicators we are observing. If we look a little bit closer at the uh, principles of dialogue teaching, there is five principles which I the most important here. So the dialogue has to be collective. So the teacher and children uh, address learning tasks together as a small group or as a whole class. Uh, the dialogue has to be reciprocal. The teacher and children listen to each other, share idea, ideas and consider alternate, alternative viewpoints. Uh, it is supportive in nature. It's cumulative and there is a purpose of uh, that classroom talk. So our uh, first step study with more than 2000 children has shown that the quality of teacher-student inter interaction makes the difference between the classroom. Uh, in the most high quality classroom, the classroom climate is positive. There are good social relations between the teacher and the students and also between the students. Teacher is sensitive on students' needs. Uh, teacher records for students' perspectives. The classroom organization and management is well done. Uh, the teacher scaffold the learning processes uh, by uh, using a lot of feedback, constructive feedback about the learning and behavior. And uh, there's time for thinking and dialogue. And all these uh, quality issues, they are uh, first affecting to the motivation and engagement of the students. So in the classroom where these issues are in high level, there is motivation and engagement usually very high level as well. And that leads to achievement and uh, good achievement and uh, better social skills of the students. If we think what is then the motivation, it's about the goals and beliefs about the skills and cap abilities expectancies of success and the task value uh, of the student, so they interest. And the best way to support uh, uh, the motivation of the students uh, is to see the students' needs for autonomy, um, competence, which uh, they can see from, uh, from the teacher's uh, feedback, for example, or the feedback from the uh, peer group and the relatedness that they they feel that they belong to the classroom and uh, and they feel good to be there in our uh, studies we have seen that there is differences between the learning motivation between the classroom 
And we have seen that uh, one of the uh, most important issue is how the teacher is organizing the classroom sessions. And uh, also the teacher's own well-being is important. So in the classroom where teacher's stress is low, the motivation of the student is high, and that uh, high motivation leads to better outcomes uh, of the students. And the same with the child-centered uh, teaching, it raised the interest in reading tasks, for example. And also the quality of education and dialogue has an effect to the better academic uh, grades. So this is my last slide, that the, how were the most effective teachers unique in our studies? So they emphasized the child-centric practices with the active role of teacher. Um, there was high quality teacher-child interaction, but the teacher was sensitive to child's needs. There was more opportunities for differentiation concerning the children's needs, and they engaged children to the activities. Um, the lessons were well planned and organized, and the curriculum emphasizes them social interaction in the classroom children's motivation, self-regulation, and competence field. So we sort of think that together we are strong. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Professor. Uh, Professor, we'll quickly move on to the question answers now. So we have received more than 11 questions for your session. Um, I'll be trying to club a few of them together. So one of the recurring questions is the challenging challenges regarding the uh, immigrant students and also uh, regarding immigrants and refugees as a whole and how uh, how the Finnish education system, whether it has been able to use education as a means of integrating uh, immigrants into the society, what are the challenges that you faced? This has come from Akanksha, Abhishek, as well as um, like this has been a recurring theme in the chat box. Yes. And I'll after this, after you answer this, there will be a set of two more questions, three more okay. questions. Yes, okay, I, I try to be very short. Um, that was a very good question because uh, uh, it's a new issue in Finland. Uh, only in, in the south part of Finland, uh, there has been immigrant students uh, uh, quite a long time and uh, uh, the teachers are prepared uh, to integrate them to the classroom. So they are in the normal classrooms. And uh, um, of course, uh, the language education is very much emphasized, the Finnish language uh, education, but also we support uh, in the schools, uh, the children's own language education. So uh, that's the way we are going. But uh, there is a, there's certain challenges with, uh, with that group and uh, we are uh, working on that a lot, yes. Okay, uh, so the next question is by Swakshadeep, who has been asking, and also by Snigdha to an extent, who have asked about the uh, discrimination and uh, and what kind of discrimination do uh, students and teachers face, or what is the inclusivity and diversity uh, methods used in teacher training? Uh, Snigdha has also asked about bullying being an issue and do students face it? What are the measures that you have incorporated? Yeah, um, we have a national program called uh, Nice School, Kiva Koulu, uh, which is uh, it has been concentrated to bullying issue quite a long time, maybe 20 years or something. So the schools have their own program, uh, how to deal with the bullying uh, issue. And of course, uh, our schools, as all schools, I think, has a uh, bullying and uh, we are working very um, effectively uh, towards that issue. And also in the teacher training, uh, that is one topic. Uh, the, our the teacher students are very interested at uh, how to behave in those situations, what are the right ways to act, and uh, how to take the uh, students and parents uh, together to solve the problem. Uh, but uh, we think that it's not only the um, issue of individuals, uh, it's all, always the society issue when it's about the bullying. Uh, Professor, maybe 
um, we are really sorry to all the participants because they have been uh, sending us brilliant questions, which uh, Professor can engage if she wants in the chat box. But we'll end with this very important question by Ishita Shivastav, and she asks: Are there psychologists or counselors for students in schools and universities? How has Finland managed or conducted its educational system during the pandemic? Oh, that that is very very important question. Uh, we have been uh, quite successful uh, to doing that. So uh, we have a, mm, the distance learning mostly in upper secondary school level, but mostly that school ha schools has been open. Uh, the basic education classrooms has been open. Um, there, of course, there's some uh, guarantee issues uh, uh, concerning uh, individual students. But uh, in that case, uh, we have used the distance learning uh, issues uh, uh, to support day learning at home. Uh, so um, the digi digital skills of uh, the teachers and students have improved during the pandemic a lot. And that has been, of course, a positive issue. At least we uh, want to think that way, that there's always there's something positive happen when there is some crisis. Uh, happening at the same time. So the digital skills has improved. But of course, uh, we are worried about the students and teachers' well-being and the stress the teachers has faced during this uh, issue because the situations are changing so much. So the teachers uh, are supported by, uh, by the National Agency of Education and also the municipality uh, administration about the regulations and also um, the equipments and uh, the guidelines, what to do, how to do, and what has been very uh, interesting and important, how the teachers have started to support each other. And so uh, uh, mm, changing the best practices, uh, uh, what works the best and, and so on. So I think that is also the positive issue on that. Thank but you so course, much. We are, yeah, of course, we are struggling with that as, as you are also. And we yes. are worried not only the well being, but also the learning loss. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you so much, Professor Maria. We're really yes. short on time. And so I'll pass on the mic to the director of the Nordic Center in India, Dr. Royal, to say a last word to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. On behalf of the Nordic Center in India and on behalf of Professor Sarkar and her team at the Center for European Studies at JNU, we would like to offer our sincere thanks to you, Professor Larkinen, and to the University of Yavaskala. Many thanks for showcasing the various dynamics that determine the phenomenal success that is Finnish education and the way Finland approaches teacher training. Sincere thanks from all of us uh, for spending your valuable time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and have a nice and good day today. Okay. Thank you. Bye yeah, bye. Bye bye. Professor Basudi said. Uh, Sarkar would take over now for a brief introduction to Professor Lisa, who is here with us. And Professor Lisa would request you to turn on your video so that we can add you to the spotlight. Thank you. I would pass it uh, pass on the mic to my colleague Sunanda for the next session. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Sunanda. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I would like to give a very short introduction about Professor Lisa. Professor Lisa is a professor in social policy at the Faculty of Social Sciences in Tampere University, Finland. And her interest is mainly how people and communities participate and have influence in society, and also specialize on relations between the citizen participation, everyday life, and urban governance policy fields. She is also engaged in several projects. It focuses on sustainable transformation in society, for example, ORSI, a consortium studies how to transfer welfare states into eco-welfare states and more information could be found in e-brochure and Professor Lisa we are very much delighted to have you here and we are looking forward to for the productive session and now I would like to invite Professor Baswati Sarkar to, to give a short welcome nod over to you ma'am. Thank you thank you Sunanda uh, welcome to the third day of our Nordic summer school Professor Lisa we are delighted to have you here 
and uh, I see that, that you have chosen a topic which is very interesting, uh, which is active citizenship in the context of Nordic welfare state. And we have been from the from day one actually discussing the Nordic welfare state, the various aspects of it, what makes it work so beautifully. And I think the the cities uh, and what came out in various sessions, even in the previous se session, which was basically on education and teachers training, uh, the uh, the the element of social trust that is very important, that is very critical when we look at the Nordic countries. And uh, um, so this whole aspect of social trust, how does it work and how does it relate to uh, the question of citizenship? Because when we look at citizenship, uh, you know, we think only in terms, sometimes we tend to think only in terms of rights, uh, you know, our rights vis-a-vis -vis the state in terms of legitimacy, accountability, all of that, asking questions, but it is also about, you know, our obligations. So when you say active citizenship, I, I think we, I'm sure you'll be highlighting how both of these aspects make a system work. So thank you once again for being with us and uh, over to you now. You have 30 minutes for the presentation and we'll have a 15 minutes q and Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And thank you for uh, inviting me. It's uh, very nice to be here. And uh, I, I think uh, in comp comparison to, uh, to the previous uh, lecture, this will be uh, different in terms of uh, uh, how I have structured. Uh, it will not be a detailed uh, uh, information on the base of uh, empirical studies, but it's more like an overview uh, of, of the issues and more like a political and policy uh, understanding of, of the phenomenon. So that's the uh, uh, way how I structure it. And now I will share the slides. Do you see them now? Yes, Professor. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my title is uh, Active Citizenship uh, in the Nordic Welfare States. And uh, uh, you already have a short introduction on my uh, background, uh, but just say a few words and a few uh, aspects uh, from my research. I have been very much uh, interested on the issue of uh, how different actors, including citizens, but also uh, experts and uh, organizations and uh, communities or, or individuals, how, how they can participate and uh, have influence uh, in society and how what kind of uh, uh, cooperation there is and what kind of aims do they have and what does it mean uh, for themselves, but also more in a, a general picture. So that's the uh, issue that I have been interested in. And uh, what I have been uh, studying is, for example, sustainable development issues at the local level and how, how people uh, understand it. How do they uh, structure their activities uh, in, in that context? Uh, but also in elder care, how people take care of their close ones, how, uh, how they get, get institutional support uh, when they need care, uh, when they have care needs. and. Uh, also with youth policies. So how do uh, uh, young people, for example, outside labor markets and education, how do they uh, participate in society? What kind of uh, understanding do they have in society? So I have been working with different uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, people and different kinds of communities. And often uh, our research uh, uh, come, starts uh, just going to the people and just going to the uh, uh, real life uh, uh, situations and starting from that uh, point, trying to understand how do they see society, uh, how they are involved, how they are excluded and uh, things like that. And this, all this is like a, a behind uh, this presentation, but now I don't go into details uh, in these kinds of uh, discussions. Uh, but uh, just like I said, I will give more like a general uh, picture of uh, of this uh, 
phenomenon. And just like uh, uh, in the introduction also was mentioned, I will focus both on rights and also the, the, that kind of uh, duties or understandings of uh, what kind of responsibilities uh, citizens have. But let's see how I... It's not... And you already uh, have had uh, lectures on uh, Nordic uh, countries, and of course you are aware of uh, where do we uh, situate uh, in a global uh, scale. But just taking this uh, picture uh, for saying a few things uh, that are important uh, for my presentation. Uh, Nordic countries is not uh, that kind of uh, uh, unique, uh, or no, or no, it's not like uh, one uh, unit. There are uh, five different uh, countries within the Nordic countries, and there are a lot of differences uh, between countries. But of course, the far, if you look from far, uh, they look more similar than if you are there uh, on the ground. But for example, Finland is uh, quite different uh, uh, in some respect. If you compare to Sweden, uh, Denmark and uh, Norway and Iceland. But then there are some uh, kind of uh, commonalities also uh, between those countries. For example, uh, civil society associations or civil society, how civil society uh, uh, have role in society. Finland and Norway are close to each other compared to Sweden, for example. Uh, in Finland and Norway, we have very strong uh, uh, traditions uh, of uh, uh, um, civil society activities where, and very strong organizations uh, uh, there, and they having a strong responsibility on, on society. But uh, in Sweden, uh, it's not it's not that there is no civil society, but it's a it's a different. Uh, there are not the organizations have had not that much uh, power and not that much uh, responsibilities in society. For example, these kinds of differences there are uh, in the countries, but also cultural differences. Uh, as you can see, we have long uh, in Finland we have long border with Russia, and of course there is cultural exchange uh, between uh, Finland and Russia, uh, not only uh, during the past years, but uh, in a long history. And of course, it has effect uh, on, on the way how our country uh, is organized and how we understand, for example, the relation between individuals and state. And then uh, Iceland, a very small country compared even to uh, other Nordic countries. and. Uh, uh, very uh, uh, special uh, uh, landscape and that kind of way how people are, uh, are living there. And also Denmark uh, dif in, in a different way, very small area, uh, high density uh, uh, in uh, some places. So it's, uh, it's different, but still there are a lot of uh, cultural uh, 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 third uh, aspects, uh, and I think that in if you think about citizenship issues, uh, we have a lot uh, in common. And of course, this uh, notion of Nordic welfare state, as you have had uh, uh, lessons already on on Nordic welfare state, uh, all these countries they have uh, uh, very uh, large public sector in that sense that uh, public authorities uh, have a lot of responsibilities on welfare issues. And that's uh, that's unique, uh, I think, uh, for Nordic societies. For example, social services and health services, care services, they are very much uh, uh, provided and organized uh, by public authorities. And of course, that, that has... Uh, National welfare systems, uh, local uh, uh, welfare systems. So municipalities are very important uh, 
uh, in this uh, uh, Nordic welfare model. And municipalities, they kind of build up on the understanding that uh, people themselves are ruling over themselves. So it's a, uh, they take care of uh, their own uh, uh, matters uh, by using uh, uh, municipality as a forum. So local authority uh, is about uh, uh, local people uh, having power uh, over their own issues. So that's the kind of traditional understanding. And uh, traditionally, we have a lot of municipalities, and we still do have, if you compare uh, to many countries, and uh, we have a lot of small municipalities. There, if, in Finland, there are uh, some municipalities only with 100 uh, uh, inhabitants or something like that. Of course, they are not, not that many, but uh, there are uh, very small municipalities. But of course, there are also la large ones uh, in our uh, scale. Uh, capital areas in all of these countries, they are bigger uh, than the other uh, uh, municipality uh, or local authority areas. For example, in Finland, uh, in Helsinki area and metropolitan area, there is uh, something one, something like 1.5 million people living, whereas in uh, total in Finland, it's a little bit over 5 million people. So it's a, a big concentration of, of our, our uh, residents. But also, as you can see from the map, uh, and if you compare uh, to the number of uh, people living in our countries, you can see uh, that uh, uh, the density of people is not very high. So we have a lot of space and, uh, uh, and there is uh, long distances between uh, municipalities and between places. So municipalities are kind of uh, self-organized and they are uh, very autonomy. Uh, they have very strong autonomy on their own matters, but also a lot of uh, uh, functions that come from the state authority. So there is a lot of uh, uh, actions that municipalities need to take uh, on the base of legislation. So. Uh, in many cases, it's not the state that takes activities, but it is the municipalities and local authorities. Solidarity is one of the things. And what very strong commitment with equality issues. And these equality issues has been especially uh, uh, considered uh, as a class, uh, social class issues, uh, gender issues, but also regional issues. As you saw that we have a country with a large, uh, uh, large, uh, um, countryside areas and then we have uh, big cities so it's a regional issue how all the regions can be uh, uh, developed at the same time uh, in, in the country and also we have had this kind of understanding that there should be uh, equality between uh, generations so uh, for example social security is uh, based on uh, shifting money from younger generations to older ones uh, or from uh, uh, 
some uh, generations without children to those with, who have uh, children at the moment. So what kind of uh, social protection uh, there are, it, it is, the whole understanding has been that uh, there are universal needs within the population and we need uh, universal services, we need universal benefits uh, to uh, fit those needs. So this is so this is like a, a traditional understanding of the uh, of the uh, citizenship, and the inclusion has been uh, based on the understanding of sameness. So we are all the same, and this of course uh, uh, comes from the fact that uh, Nordic countries have been very homogeneous uh, populations. Uh, of course, that's not the case uh, anymore. Uh, Finland still is uh, very. Uh, uh, homogeneous in many respects, but uh, uh, for example, uh, in Sweden, there is a, a lot of uh, 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 citizens now having a migrant background. And what I want to emphasize uh, here is that citizenship uh, has been very much understood as a social, as, uh, as a social phenomenon. So, uh, of course, there are these kind of political rights and economical uh, rights that are basing uh, uh, citizenship uh, issues, but the social aspect has been very much uh, emphasized, and this has contributed in in the uh, creating of the welfare state, creating the uh, uh, welfare system that supports uh, uh, individuals in their everyday life. And one of the aspects in Nordic countries is that actually the uh, social security is provided for the individuals, not for the families, not for the uh, uh, communities, but it is for the individuals. So it's a relation between an individual and the state. And uh, basing on this uh, understanding of universalism, uh, we have the uh, notion of universal uh, citizenship, and uh, it, it, here is a, just a small picture showing that we have this variety of, of uh, citizens, but still uh, the understanding is that uh, all they have the universal uh, uh, rights, all they have the universal uh, uh, connection uh, to the society. And I already discussed about this uh, social rights uh, issues, and that's really like a key idea behind the welfare state. And why do we have that kind of uh, welfare st state as we do? And then uh, the last sentence in this uh, slide about this collective responsibility for the welfare, and this is also a strong uh, 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 kind of value uh, behind the welfare state. As I already mentioned that the uh, social security is provided for the individuals, but it's not the responsibility of the individual, but it is the collective responsibility to take care of all the individuals. So the, that's the logic there. And here is just to uh, summarize uh, what kind of uh, ideas there are. There is this notion of Scandinavian citizenship. You can also call it Nordic or universal citizenship. Uh, and, uh, but having more like a, a practical or active uh, uh, understanding of citizenship, there has been a notion that uh, societies are based on cooperation. So uh, there is a, a strong uh, tradition of cooperating between political parties, labor unions, employers, organizations, and uh, ha having this kind of consensus culture. So trying to solve common problems by finding uh, uh, common uh, solutions uh, in, in, in cooperations. And uh, for individuals, uh, as I already mentioned, that the, uh, for, for example, social security is provided for the individuals, but citizens are more also in general terms are understood as, as individuals and uh, not uh, any kind of individuals, but more or less uh, workers, 
so participating in the labor market. So that's very important uh, in, in the Nordic model. Uh, it's men and it's women. So the uh, kind of uh, understanding behind the uh, uh, welfare state is that there is a full employment. So that the whole idea is based on the understanding that all those who can, they will participate in the labor market. And also participate in uh, other uh, other uh, aspects of uh, society. So they are regarded as members of society and as members who are doing their share. And here I just have two pictures. Uh, so uh, referring the first one with this uh, 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 dirty hands, it, it is uh, saying that all who can they will participate in the labor market and that's uh, something that members of society do and that's very uh, important so the whole social security uh, is more or less organized on the on the understanding that uh, everybody participates there but also uh, of course everybody should participate in the uh, political process of of uh, our society and the, the other picture is uh, actually from my home city from Tampere and uh, that's uh, uh, weeks before election and there are some uh, cabins that uh, uh, those who would like to be uh, elected are advertising themselves and giving uh, information what will they run for and then uh, others uh, as citizens go there and ask and discuss about the issues and things like that so uh, it's it has been very uh, powerful notion as a part of a, a universal citizenship but that all all uh, members of society participate in uh, in elections either as voters or as candidates and uh, the society has been understood to be very structured and very much organized on uh, on cooperation But uh, as there was in my title, this active citizenship, and this is something that uh, uh, actually is now visible uh, more or less in our society. And there has been, this is like what I have been told, it's like a traditional uh, story of our society. It's not, it has not gone, it's still there. But we also had this new notion of, of uh, uh, active citizenship. And uh, Shift is the understanding that the state and the public authority is not uh, for doing things. It's not for providing welfare, for example, but it's like a, a enabling others to do, enabling ac action and enabling uh, responsibilities. So whereas uh, the, in a traditional uh, story, public uh, authorities provide services for uh, everyday life, uh, 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 for taking care of everyday life things uh, with the notion of, of active citizenship you need to take care of yourself and if you can't then you can be provided help and this kind of uh, uh, understanding is uh, nowadays uh, for example in Finland uh, 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 integrated and uh, uh, put in the leg legislation so we have a lot of uh, new uh, legislation coming from past 20 years or so that favor citizen participation and uh, individual possibility of having their own choice and making their own uh, 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 choices uh, for the care and things like that. And it has been seen as a, a way of responding to those problems that this kind of uh, traditional universal citizens cannot uh, do. So if you need better environment, if you need to engage citizens in society, if there is a problem with uh, uh, participation in election, and if there is not enough money for the, for the services, then the answer is, okay, we need more active citizenship. And then we need to transform our activities towards that uh, end. And that will help, help to uh, uh, reform our so society. And here is the uh, understanding what uh, uh, active citizenship uh, is about. It's about responsibilities 
So you are responsible on your own uh, welfare, but also on your close ones, uh, on the community, on the networks and things like that. But it's also about uh, participating uh, not only uh, through uh, re representative democracy and through elections, but it's also uh, deliberating different uh, issues in society, taking part in uh, taking care of the environment and things like that. And what is also very uh, important is uh, the, the uh, aspect of choice. Citizens, active citizens are more or less uh, consumers uh, in welfare markets. So it's not that public authority will provide everybody the same services, but uh, citizens as, uh, uh, as individuals uh, uh, need to find, find and also finance their own services, uh, at least to say, uh, some respect. And if in a traditional sense, uh, uh, citizens as members of uh, uh, members of society do they serve uh, in active citizenship understanding, it's individuals and communities that do they serve. So still, the labor market is very much emphasized. Everybody should work. Everybody who could, they should be in the labor market, and they should uh, take their uh, share uh, from that. Respect, but that's not enough. Uh, uh, they should also engage with different uh, uh, activities in the local communities, in local uh, policy making, uh, having discussions, and taking uh, uh, care of uh, uh, planning issues and things like that. But what is more important, maybe, than uh, having these deliberations, is that they take care of themselves and they take care of uh, others as well. So they uh, they live healthy life. They take care of themselves, not being in need, but trying to be active in many senses. And if you have close ones, then you take care of them and you have the responsibility of organizing the care and things like that. And the picture with these papers here just refers to our uh, organizing help. It is not just going to the public authorities and saying that I have now this need, I have, I need help, but you need to uh, find a private provider who can help you with there uh, and you need different contracts and things like that. This has widened the ways uh, people can participate and have difference in society. So there are new ways of participating in governing practices. There are no new ways of participating in administrative practices. Also, uh, new ways of uh, being engaged with uh, uh, markets, uh, also in the services, not only in products. Uh, Informal and formal networks, not only this kind of official organizations or uh, interest based organizations, but like a neighborhood uh, uh, communities that just organize for one thing and then disappear, those kinds of uh, things. And of course, uh, in social media or this kind of uh, uh, virtual networks as well. But of course, also through various citizen movements and civil society activities and uh, and uh, i'm coming to conclusion i have five minutes still and uh, that's uh, that's enough uh, one of the things uh, that is important in in uh, understanding the uh, active citizenship in uh, Nordic welfare state context is that actually in the Nordic welfare state context, uh, citizens have been active also in, a, in, that, in that traditional way of understanding uh, universal citizenship. It is participating in society. But this active citizenship uh, notion uh, changes the way how people are expected and uh, uh, actually are uh, participating in society. Uh, and uh, the whole idea of citizenship is somehow uh, shifting. And what is happening actually is that uh, Nordic citizenship is converging to European model of uh, citizenship. So we have a kind of unique uh, uh, 
citizenship model uh, in the Nordic countries, uh, if you compare the uh, European uh, uh, countries. But now there is uh, more movement uh, towards the uh, same way of uh, uh, doing things. And of course, that comes from European Union and uh, those kinds of uh, regulations and policies and, uh, and uh, things that are happening there. And what is uh, uh, valuable to understand is that there is a different pace uh, if you compare uh, uh, to that kind of more traditional approaches on citizenship in Nordic countries. Because uh, as I already told, the universalism and the understanding of unity is very strong there uh, in this traditional uh, way of understanding citizen uh, in Nordic context. Uh, active citizenship uh, uh, discourse or practices, they assume that all of us are different. All of us, are, uh, there is a diversity in, in society. And there are different citizens, there are different needs, there are different groups, there are different opinions and things like that. And for example, from Finnish perspective, that's, uh, uh, that's of course the case. The uh, society is more diverse than it might have been uh, uh, earlier, but I don't think that the, uh, the traditional story, uh, even though it was this universal understanding of needs and things like that, uh, of course there was differences, but they were not like uh, pro to the uh, uh, four, but now uh, there is more understanding that all of us have different needs. And, uh, and this has uh, consequences, uh, on the responsibilities uh, that uh, citizens have, because all of us are different nowadays. We also uh, are responsible, uh, responsible for our differences. So we need to take care of uh, ourselves uh, more or less. And uh, this new notion of uh, active citizenship and citizen participation uh, has extended those possibilities of being uh, or participating in, in society. But what it does not address, and this is something that uh, uh, needs to all to be uh, needs all also uh, to be understood if we think about what the meaning does it carry uh, to Nordic uh, context and, uh, uh, for example, to Finnish uh, society is that all the individuals uh, are not, not the same also in terms of resources or capacities or things like that. If, if you need to, uh, for example, in, in Finland, if you need to uh, organize care um, by using your own money, most Finns cannot afford. They, they, they just don't have uh, uh, enough money because we have so high uh, salary uh, uh, costs and uh, actually the uh, division between uh, 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 salaries is not high. So, so it's very hard to organize uh, uh, care if you need to pay it, it from your own pocket. Most people cannot afford. Uh, but of course, it also relates with uh, other other issues. For example, if you are young uh, people and you do not have education in, fin in Finland or in Nordic context, it really puts you in a position that it's very hard to be a member or being part or ha having active citizenship in, in our society, because there is not many possibilities for those. Uh, in order to enter the labor market, you need to have a degree. If you do not have, it's very difficult to uh, have any any kind of uh, uh, positions there. So uh, not everybody can act. Uh, I'm in the sorry same to way. intervene. Then. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm just to about to uh, stop. And okay. uh, there are increasing inequalities uh, in society. But just like I uh, say here in the la last. Uh, uh, sentence that would be another story and this was the story of active citizenship but you need to remember the other side as well thank you thank you very much for such an enlightening lecture session uh here we have a few questions in the chat box uh, i'd like to read for you um 
like Krishna Kumar Bhargav wants to know with the problem of aging population and tax paying base going down and influx of migrants, how the Nordic states are going to sustain their development model in future? Sorry, I didn't hear the first sentence. With the problem Is of the aging, problem aging po population. Yes, yeah. the aging population and the tax paying base going down and influx yeah. of migrants. Mm -hmm. how, how do the Nordic states are going to sustain their development model in future? Mm. Yeah, that's a question. I mean, that's the uh, that's an issue that uh, uh, has not been solved. Actually, it is something that we just uh, 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 hope that it will be uh, solved uh, one day. And I think there is a lot of uh, uh, pressure uh, for our pension system, for example, because it's uh, uh, very uh, scenarios for those who are now uh, retired those who have been working uh, all their life and uh, uh, they are they are having income based uh, pensions uh, and they are kind of uh, high uh, high pensions and when you go to the young younger generations they have difficulties in entering in the labor markets and uh, having the uh, same kind of salaries as their parents did so that's the uh, that's a structural problem of course but of course i think also we need to find new ways of uh, 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 addressing uh, aging uh, society. We need to accept that we are aging and we need to find ways of organizing society from that perspective. Uh, we also have very uh, uh, active, uh, uh, it's, it, the aging is not a social problem. I mean, uh, aging is a thing that happens uh, uh, in, in society and uh, we have a lot of active and uh, capable uh, uh, aged uh, uh, members in our society. Of course, there are some care needs uh, at, at the very end, but uh, that's not the whole picture. Okay, uh, so I'm clubbing the question of Sayant and Gosal and Mohammed. So no, the number one is, what are your reflection on the stringent, stringent Danish citizenship case in comparison to other Nordic countries? Do you feel it is justified? And the other one is, is there applicability of European Union citizenship model in Nordic states? I, I I didn't hear the first sentence. There is some uh, problem with the. Uh, so, what was the case? The case was the, what are your reflections on the stringent Danish citizenship case in comparison to the other Nordic countries? Do you feel it is justified? Uh, I'm not sure if I know uh, if I understand the question correctly, but I see that there are. Not, uh, there are differences between different European countries and uh, on the on the ways the uh, societies uh, uh, are organized. For example, if you compare to German, uh, it is totally differently organized compared to uh, Nordic countries. Uh, there is a, a strong a civil society uh, that takes a lot of responsibilities uh, on different uh, things. But also, the, uh, for example, if you think about uh, labor market participation, it is based on the, uh, that the, the men are in the working uh, life and labor markets and uh, women are at home. That's, of course, not the uh, story uh, in whole, but still the uh, society has been organized in that way that there is a parent uh, at home. And other countries, that, that's not the case. I mean, OK. Uh Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, you can take the questions from the chat box since uh, yeah. like we are running out of time. Yeah. Uh, so, so you can take the questions in the chat box or you can just message there. So I would like to invite Christopher ma'am for the board. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Nordic Center in India and on behalf of uh, Professor Bhaswati Sarkar and her team at the new Center for East, uh, Center for European Studies, I thank you very much, Professor Lisa, for your erudite exposition of the unique trajectory that the notion of citizenship has taken in the Nordic context and for focusing on how, how the dynamic of acti active citizenship legitimizes the Nordic welfare model. Thank you very much for your time. We're very grateful for your presence and your participation here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I did share the screen. I didn't uh, notice that you would like to see me better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you and have a nice uh, summer school. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Um
I would like to hand over to my colleague Sanskriti Rajkwa. Thank you. Thank you, Suranda. Uh, welcome, Professor Kayati. Um, it's really good to have you here with us. I would like to uh, have a short introduction of Professor Khalid before I pass on to pass on the mic to Professor Sarkar. So, for our audience. Uh, Professor Khalid Khayati is a political scientist and he has fulfilled his PhD program from the Institute for Research and Migration Ethnicity Society from Linkokip University. Currently, he works as a senior university lecturer at the Department of Management and Engineering, in the Division of Political Science in the same university in Sweden. His research is mainly centered on diaspora, transnational relations, and the theory of transborder citizenship where different migrant and refugee groups, especially Kurds in Western Europe, and especially those in France and Sweden constitute the principal empirical illustration of his research. Dr. Khyati received a DEA in political science uh, from Provence in France in 1998. And I pass the mic now with that to Professor Sarkar. Okay, I'm not on mute. Uh, thank you, Sanskriti. A uh, very warm welcome to you, Professor Khayati. Uh, absolutely delighted to have you here and on a topic which we are on which we are all very interested when we look at Europe from this side. And we it appears to us, and especially post-2015 refugee crisis, that Europe is really struggling to come to terms with its new diversity. And uh, even the Nordic countries, which are otherwise near perfect, picture perfect, are also now struggling to come to terms with the diversity and how they can accommodate uh, the diverse needs of their uh, now almost permanent population in terms of uh, the immigrants who have come in. So we are really eagerly waiting for you to give us a very, very, you know, uh, I don't know, I, I, we are eagerly waiting that you'll take us through how, the, how these challenges and how the discourse and the narrative is is in these uh, in all of these five countries and again there are differences in how they are dealing with it so over to you because i'm sure you you know you'll at the end of it see that there are box full of questions so th you have 30 minutes and then 15 minutes of q a okay thank you so much uh, just, uh thank you so much professor sarkar and thank you dear uh, uh, Rajkova, i don't know if i pronounce your you name correctly i'm myself of kurdish background so actually, my culture is also originating from the Sanskrit uh, culture. So I think still we share in Kurdish language, Persian language. I speak those languages. And even there, of course, Turkish is completely different. And I'm in Sweden. I'm Swedish speaking since many, many years. So I feel really, really good and happy to be with you, to share this short moment with you. But my first question is to you, just you attended a lecture and then maybe lecture earlier. You don't need to take any break, any, you know, okay. <laughs> so- This is so short. <laughs> Professor, we, we, have, we are, you know, uh, we had the first lecture on the Finnish education system, which said that they have a 45 minute slot for classes. Okay. So we, are, we have nearly taken on that, but the break we have not taken in as yet. Oh, okay, so okay. We are reaching but the model slowly. As I see, this is about the powerful nation, how you struggle with this COVID. I follow, you know, the developing of that. I, it makes me sad because it's going quite in negative direction in India. And you see each day is more than 200,000 new cases which is maybe is decreasing in Sweden. We have 7,000, 8,000, but small population, it cannot be compared. But anyway, I hope and wish plenty good for you in India that is turned in, in the in positive direction very, very soon. Okay, I'm going to share my PowerPoint with you. Uh, so as you see here, uh, Okay, I'm not good technically. I'm not as developed as you, but I do. I try to do my best. Uh, yes, one more time here too. Okay, I think you can see my, my picture as you see from the title. I will be really brief and basic Sweden migration prospect and limits. Uh, so this is the title. Um, uh, you you presented me, so actually this is part of my. Uh, own research. I, I want to see the disposition of that lecture is, uh, is on three parts. The first starts, I'm going to give you a brief uh, historical background of the arrival of refugee and the policy structure of migration and migrants and refugee and the policy structure 
adopted and developed by Swedish states throughout the years. And of course, second part will be about the, the limits of, of the integration and more specifically, the focus will be put on those ethnic and cultural and discursive boundaries that's created a, situa a kind of uh, society divided uh, directly, maybe okay to some extent physically, but more uh, 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 in terms of identity and uh, common sense and of course national identity. Okay, Sweden, as you know, maybe I received already plenty of, of introduction from earlier, uh, you know, uh, the other, other, other professors and, uh, uh, you know, those uh, from the, the diplomatic, you know, sphere. Sweden is known to be a country of consensus, you know, uh, since the uh, 30s. Uh, uh, so actually everything is decided from, by, by consensus. So uh, it was the reason, you know, to 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 create a, such a functioning nation or state. So actually, the parts, uh, uh, you know, the division of labor or maybe the antagonist should uh, have been reduced, which Sweden, you know, reached that point. So Sweden is a country of consensus. It's also known a country of common or collective agreement. So collective agreement it does mean that there is no room for, you know. A collective protest because uh, before the you know uh, the sides uh, they uh, express happiness or unhappiness about the outcome of agreement the agreement of course by the intervention of of uh, trade unions is already you know achieved and reached and welfare state you know this is the social democratic model which follows the general model and everybody and every citizen is equal vis-a-vis -vis the law. And uh, in terms of social citizenship, the social you know, resources that are all equal according to law, democratic value and human uh, rights, part of this universal discourse, but implemented, but also partly forwarded as a kind of image of Sweden in, in the international politics. So commitment to the global peace. And of course, Sweden is a country has implemented a very generous immigration policy since the, since the, you know, the, 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 the end of the Second World War. But of course, you know, as you see from the picture during, the, during those 25 years from the beginning of 50s and to the mid of 70s, so Sweden opted for, uh, for uh, receiving labor migrants and mostly from countries like former Yugoslavia, Turkey, Greece, Portugal, partly Italy. And of course, those from neighboring uh, Nordic countries, they could come to Sweden without any agreement as just could act as a, uh, ordinary Swedish citizen to come to settle down and find a job. And then after these, you know, uh, suddenly we had an economic crisis, but it was not because of the crisis, uh, domestic crisis. Something happened in the Middle East uh, in the 70s. Uh, it was the, the consequence of a conflict between, you know, Arab, Arabic nation and Israel. And those uh, oil producing countries, uh, they decided to stop the production. So it created a huge crisis. So. Uh, in Swedish industry start to recruit and many became just in uh, unemployed at that time. So it was a stop for labor migration officially. Then we have this period of family reunification and then the beginning of 80s, this is a Swedish migration history is marked by the arrival of very big group of refugees from different parts of, of the world, mostly from Northern African countries, from the Middle East, as I'm part of that, I come to Sweden in the middle of 90s. And then we have those selective migration, uh, you know, elites or well-educated people that are welcome to Sweden. And this is why we see more than more uh, Indian citizen or Indian national around me in the university. Some of them are our students, they do their master with us and they stay here. And of course they have perceived in very nice and positive way, I want to tell you. And then we have those group called for single refugee children, mostly from Afghanistan. 
they are all under 18 years, so they are treated under specific legal circumstances. And then, as Professor Serkar, you, you, you alluded to these um, uh, mass refugee movements uh, during 2014 and 15, and Sweden and Germany specifically among those two countries, they received a um, uh, greater share of those, uh, those groups. And then, of course, uh, you know, arrival of this group, it does mean that uh, uh, continuous changes in the general structure of the society in terms of demography, in terms of ethnic relations, in terms of culture and politics, and of course, other, you know, structure of the society. So it does mean that the states need to intervene, need to maybe develop a specific policy in order to 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 handle uh, to manage the new situation because the, the Sweden is not the same. So Sweden, in the beginning, opted for a called assimilation policy. They wanted to assimilate all those newly arrived uh, in the mainstream uh, culture, and then Sweden changed the policy and opted for a multicultural or multiculturalism as a model of integration, and then. Uh, yeah, uh, in the you know the end of 80s and beginning of of 90s is uh, shifted into another title which called integration. At that time, less focus was put on uh, culture and ethnicity and identity, but more on helping, for example, uh, people with uh, refugee and immigrant backgrounds to find position in the you know labor market or housing areas for uh, education in Sweden. Then in shift to a uh, very fuzzy term like diversity, and then uh, one more time back to the assimilation, but in a more smooth manner, uh, yes, defending or uh, protecting Swedish core value or uh, main cultural reference. And, and actually today we have more than ever refugees and people with immigrants background. One can say maybe up to 20% of entire Swedish population of, of the, those backgrounds. But what is the title of integration policy? Actually, I am a researcher from that field. I don't know because there is none and nothing. Okay, and goals is achieving equal uh, opportunity, freedom of choice, solidarity and cooperation. And for this, uh, you know, achieving a functioning and equal rights for everybody, regardless ethnic or religious background. So the Swedish state successively uh, throughout the history created a not big number of, of institutions in order to facilitate integration processes for, for, for people and helping them, like the Ombudsman and uh, according voting rights for those just after three years in uh, local elections, education of mother tongue in order to helping uh, yes, uh, children with immigrants background to preserve their language of origin uh, and then of course uh, helping assisting people uh, and giving them money or uh, other financial support to create their ethnic and cultural association and of course uh, Okay, the process of naturalization and obtaining dual citizenship or access to Swedish, the institution of citizenship is quite uh, easier in Sweden compared, maybe not to those other Nordic countries, but compared to France and Germany, they say, okay, is, is quite good. And certain investment in those areas, mostly inhabited by people with immigrants back. That those projects implemented success. success. One of them, actually, I am, I am putting focus most in the dynamic and positive aspect of migration. Actual investigation so they can.
2018, we had difficulty to shape government and it lasted for four months, uh, the process of negotiation and creating a government and migration was one of the major question uh, and the equation is not, was not a kind of uh, gathering or a, a basic for common sense or uh, uh, letting parties to approach each other, but it was a, a major of the a major of division is created very specific political situation for the first time, the end of political consensus, or maybe the end of classical, you know, block parties, red and uh, blue. Right now, we have a, a, a right wing political party, nationalist one called Sweden, uh, Sweden Democrat, and they are increasing in the super and certain their second party and large party following the the public opinion or the set one, but it, it will have very decisive role in next election. So, but at the same time we have, of course, we, you can notice much higher in employment with people with immigrants background, ethnification of labor market. My own brother is a taxi driver. If you travel to Sweden and you see uh, Stockholm, you see some specific uh, labor areas as they are uh, reserved or booked from the beginning for certain ethnic groups. So people of Kurdish background or Iranian background, they are driving taxi. Those from Latin America or certain groups from the Middle East, they are in the cleaning areas. So you see kind of ethnification of labor market. And of course, Sweden suffers a lot of so-called ethnic segregation or housing segregation. According to certain researchers, Sweden is the, one of the most segregated uh, country of the world. Okay, the reason why those causal, you know, re relation, what, what is the cause? Some researchers, you connect it uh, to the economic, you know, pro socioeconomic factors, and above all those economic recession that we know um, in the beginning of 90s and which uh, followed by a huge transformation of the Swedish welfare state and the uh, very, very fast and quite uh, all reaching process of privatization at that time. So uh, we have a situation, not any longer government, but we enter a, a, a condition of governance. It does mean that plenty of private actors, they have huge impact on public policy and political processes. But the most for me as my research outlines, racial and ethnic boundaries is coming uh, quite common in Sweden. As you see from the list, actually it is not new, this phenomena, racialization of the society and the understanding, perceiving people throughout the belong, uh, belonging, line of belonging to specific ethnicity or religion, Okay, you say this is because of that, because of uh, increasing criminality, because of global terrorism and Islamism. But as you see, you follow my list, Sweden is a society opted already ma many hundred years before nine, uh, in the 20th century. They treated their, um, uh, uh, their own uh, you know, domestic ethnic group or uh, indigenous called uh, the Samis, Actually, they've been systematically discriminated, both socially and culturally and economically. Sweden is a country, is the first country, modern country ever in the world, uh, created a race biological institute in the very famous city of Uppsala, which is the first university city of Sweden. Then we have Sweden implemented a kind of policy of sterilization, not on Swedish uh, ethnic. Uh, uh, indigenous ethnic groups, but of those ethnic groups, according to the maybe official discourse for the uh, general state policy uh, was presented as undesired people. So maybe the Roms, uh, uh, the other maybe minorities which lived at that time in the periphery of the society. So a process of a policy of sterilization, and believe me, uh, my friends, the number of sterilized individuals uh, was more than 65,000 during this year. This was a huge project. So already in the in 88, 
a small municipality in southern Sweden, Sweden they implemented, they followed a ref, they organized a referendum in order to say no uh, to the arrival on refugee on our soon. So those, you know, uh, marking, uh, for example, the, the, the line of division between we and them, and who are migrants, who are Sweden, it is a quite old, old, old history in Sweden. It is not a new phenomenon. It's deeply rooted in the, in the you know, uh, culture, in self, the self-perception, and of course, in the uh, public institution and those institutions related to the, to the uh, okay, to Sweden. So one thing is very important for me, the reason, this is why I'm repeating myself and uh, talking a little bit more about racial and ethnic boundaries. Uh, so the, the, in Sweden, uh, as you know, this is something which is, you know, postulated by existing research, those uh, racial and ethnic boundaries, they are really strong as you live in a kind of both physically and uh, culturally divided uh, nation or cities. And the one sign you heard those, uh, you know, uh, indigenous, uh, original Swedish ethnic Swedes. And on the one hand, you have those multitude of refugee and immigrants group who arrived to Sweden throughout the years from, from the different, different countries and different regions of the world. So, uh, and this, this kind of ethnic boundary, the con consequences of that ethnic and rational boundaries has created also a very clear and obvious uh, physical division. We have those segregated areas uh, around the major cities, and mostly and sometimes up to 100%, 97% completely inhabited by people with immigrants and refugee background. And of course, with plenty of uh, other related socioeconomic problems. So the reason maybe it is kind of embedded or rooted deeply, as I said, in the idea of Swedishness and maybe the project of creating a home for people, for him. This is a kind of, there is not that concept is used fr uh, uh, frequently, but used may, uh, quite frequently earlier in 50s and 60s and 70s. So creating a, a home for all Swedes, but it did mean, they did mean, for example, those native uh, ethnic Swedes, not the other who are, um, who arrive from other, other, other countries. So the project of forced, forced uh, sterilization, the Swedish welfare regime, which is also has that uh, dividing boundaries. There are uh, quite concrete reasons for me, but most, mostly the notion of Swedishness and who belongs to the na uh, Swedish nation or state, or these days, as Benedict Anderson you know, says, the notion of imagined community. Uh, it does mean who, are, who actually are, uh, can be considered as Swedes. Uh, this is quite unclear. Okay, legally and formally in the institution, everybody is, co as, are co is considered as, as the belonging to the state and from the time you, you, you have the citizenship, but in the reality and the, in the discourses and the cultural perception is completely different. So for that mean, the notion of invandrar, immigrant, which is quite pejorative and negatively conceived has been created. As Sweden, uh, suddenly it becomes a divided society. On the one side, we have Imandrare, these immigrants, negatively conceived and perceived. And on the other hand, those Swiss that they are living maybe in better uh, standard and better life condition. So this Imandrare actually is Swedish invention, which implemented in a huge spectra of uh, different uh, people with uh, hugely different you know, ethnic and cultural backgrounds in order to simplify for themselves. Because as, um, as uh, uh, Jacques Darida says, is kind of in this binary opposition, when Swedes, Swedes, they need to have an idea about themselves, a kind of self-image or self-perception. So it is not created when in, in a kind of model of binary opposition is not related or compared to those 
they are perceived as anti-theist or anti-men. So they are, this is why they have created this notion of immandral or immigrant, which is negatively conceived. But this is not the ulma. The last part I'm going to, even in that context, there are plenty sources, alternative sources of empowerment for the groups. So group as they are cre creative, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, they have a dynamic and uh, they use those dynamisms uh, in order to construct themselves in the social spaces subjectively. So I use the notion of diaspora and those transnational practices when, for example, uh, this is about simultaneous participation of one, maybe those people like me who arrived to Sweden, at the same time they are belonging I am participating in the Swedish political, social, institutional, and legal processes and frameworks, but maybe I have some other commitment to my background, to Kurdish one or to Iranian one or something in the Middle East. So it is called simultaneous participation or a kind of transnational or transborder citizenship. It practice and plenty of people in the Swedish institution, they are doing this. And this is something which is not addressed directly by public policy. And I am, I, 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 I try to be, uh, how many minutes do I have? So in order to finish it, Professor Sekar. Your microphone is mute. Five minutes. But, okay, is enough for me, five minutes. Okay, so diaspora, as this notion is originating from, from, from Greek language is, is for me, is a quite a, a good notion in order to put a clear definition for, for those uh, huge numbers of ethnic and cultural and religious and social group who came to, to Sweden in order to create those specific communities and develop uh, a big number of transnational ties and create uh, uh, plenty of uh, projects. So for the notion, diaspora actually, this is a definition that I take from the American sociologist, uh, Roger Brubaker. Uh, so a people can be considered as a diasporic people or population. The, uh, the, the group must display these three components. A history of dispersion, whether it is uh, voluntary or not, mostly forced. Uh, a homeland orientation which maintained after arrival to the new country. And of course, a kind of identity maintenance, a boundary, let me say a specific identity, which is not directly uh, similar or comp uh, similar to the, uh, uh, to the majority, uh, you know, culture's identity, nor to the, to the identity of former homeland. So those uh, notion that you see there uh, of um, maybe those references that you can identify that a diaspora group can be created uh, and the you know, uh, premises of those notions, common origin, ethnicity, language, or religion, or notion, or, or common history as mix up all of them. So as you see, for example, this is like for what the PowerPoint picture, there are those groups only smaller one that is not there, not all of them, just I have a list in order to show how many diasporas or diasporic population we can just uh, have in Sweden, who are not directly, as I see in the public policy, at this as, as diasporic or uh, their uh, transnational commitment is uh, actually excluded from the, from the public policy. Okay, uh, so those Theory, I want to show some, some pictures here. Uh, so in order to finish it. So this is a huge demonstration. I don't know if some of you have ever visited Stockholm or uh, you have some affinity with Sweden. This is the, the heart of, of the Swedish capital, Stockholm. Never ever a Swedish political party, I mean in the first my demonstration uh, is able to collect or to gather too many people, like as you see in the picture. And this is only a specific ethnic group, the Kurdish one. Why I show the picture of Kurdish one? Because this is my research. I, as I am a background, of course, is easier. But as you see, they are holding 
that Kurdish flags, they are completely invaded the heart of the city. But believe me, the day after, you cannot find any mention, any allusion of that demonstration in the Swedish media and Swedish paper, as it doesn't exist. But if you see, for example, some arrangement in one church or some group of people that are, are uh, together and drinking a coffee is uh, mentioned in the media. And why I, this is part of this actually selective, uh, you know, inclusion and inclusion. But as you see, those Kurdish, people of Kurdish background are even holding Swedish flag in order to say, okay, we are a mix of both. It's, not, it's no problem, don't worry. Uh, so this is another group exactly in the same place, maybe those of Turkish background. And those people, let's say, these, these guys of Iranian background, he's already a minister, minister for consumer after. And this one is coming from Turkey, I think, um, but of a Christian, a Syrian background. He's a minister, or be, before minister of education, and now he's a minister of enterprise, uh, Ibrahim Baylan. This lady, she's a man. She was deputy of Swedish parliament from Social Democrat three times for gender equality and human rights. She is a wonderful. And that guy also a friend of mine, very famous writer of Kurdish issue and Kurdish background. Uh, he wrote one of the most debated, you know, Noel. And this guy, uh, he's my favorite, Theodor uh, Kalifati, is one of the most brilliant uh, uh, poet ever in Sweden, and they are all uh, issued from a background of from immigrants or maybe labor migration or refugee migration. So, as you see, for example, plenty of such a, a such a, you know climbing in the institutional and social hierarchy. So you see, people of uh, immigrant and refugee background, they are doing things, and they show. Uh, clear indication and evidences of dynamism. And they claim that those, they are not only showed in the public spaces that I'm doing sport or something, uh, they claim that they must be also being part of national identity and this was being included in the, in the mainstream. A Syrian group, they came, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, parents of them as of neighbor migrants, but when they uh, lost their jobs in the mid 70s, they created a small association. And those associations developed in a huge uh, sport project, uh, not least, for example, the creation of a very big football team like Asiriska, this one. That one has reached the top, the highest division of, of Swedish, you know, uh, uh, football sport. And the other one, also of a Syrian, Syrian background, Suryanska, uh, equally, they also reached uh, the highest position in, in the Swedish uh, sport. And that one of Kurdish issue, they follow the example of this Assyrian group. And also 10 years ago, they created a small association in a medium-sized Swedish city in order to help young people just to be integrated and to avoid crimin criminality or drug abuses and then transform in the real sport project and uh, develop and develop until they at reach also the highest position of football uh, in, in Sweden. And they are playing now in division one, as you see. But as you see, one more time, similar to the demonstration in, in, in Stockholm, you see Kurdish flags together with Swedish flag. This is clear uh, example of that new, uh, more inclusive and multi-dimensional Swedish identity that those people in a way claim do uh, that kind of understanding should be also implemented, implemented or uh, part of the general, you know, I, Identity. Here is, is, a, is a city. It's not only about integration, and even Sweden itself becomes extended by means of migration. This is a, a medium sized town in the heart of Turkish Anatolia. Many years ago, our former premier minister was on visit in that town, and he thanked the people for, okay, thank you so much. You decorated the city because of me. No, absolutely not because of you, because the town is 
all the time decorated but Swedish flags, the portraits of royal family, and even certain streets and parks, they are, have Swedish names. Why? Because greater part of inhabitants of that place were former workers. They moved back to their place of origin, but they took with themselves plenty of Swedishness and you know those cultural references and they are implemented in the, their native places. So in a way, Sweden also become as an extended far beyond its uh, formal boundaries, form, uh, physical boundaries. So the premier minister is staying in for a park and the park, as you see, the name is Olof Palme Park in Turkey, of course. And it becomes a very, you know, topic for the debate. And you maybe know that guy. For me, he's the incarnation of that new, new identity or uh, new perception of Swedishness. His name is Latan Ibrahim. I think I don't know how much you are interested in football, but he's he's he's, he's still playing. He's 79, uh, playing in Milano in Italy, and he recently came back to the national team because he's not only a kind of uh, football player. But he's also a reference for many, many people with immigrant and refugee background. You see kind of iconic uh, scenes in that guy. So uh, actually, as you see, as he's from Bosnia and Herzegovina originally, OK, maybe he's Muslim. But many years ago, he lost one of his brother. And actually, the event of the, of the brother, he, he passed away. and the, as you see, the, the funeral ceremony of him, he has, of the brother of Zlatan Ibrahimovic, and you see an is a Muslim imam in front of, of the coffin and, and, and the body. That picture, I didn't find any allusion to that event of Zlatan and his brother in Swedish media. I found it in Arabic media. Why? You know, being a Swede for following, you know, taking it from the ethnic boundary, as is condition, only a part of you is desired. The, the whole of you, it must be, you know, cut up. So this Zlatan, okay, you're welcome. You are the incarnation of the Swedish type. You uh, should be all the time in forefront. So you take a huge place uh, in the media, but not that side of you. Professor, uh, yeah. I'm really sorry to intervene, but like we have just less than 10 minutes left. Uh, I, am I am finished now. It was the okay. final picture. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. We have more than seven to eight questions. Um, so I'd like to just read out a few to them since we are short in time. Uh, the first question is by Sumbul Parveen, and she wants to ask you that, do you see the current social democratic led government's shift from the benevolent asylum policy to introducing and upholding the 2016 austere asylum policies yes. as Sweden's breaking from humanitarianism? Yes, this is a very good question. And if I have no time to answer you fully, so you have, uh, please uh, note my email here in the first picture. And uh, if you have even question related to my university, I'm here for helping you. Please don't hesitate to write me. Yes, true. The answer is in the question. So uh, social democrats only, okay, they implemented this cosmopolitan uh, uh, refugee receptions, you know, philosophy idea, but after two, three weeks, they shifted into uh, a more restrictive policy. And uh, the all uh, Swedish parties, with certain, you know, differences, they are all following now the, the, the austerity and the uh, policy of restriction, of course. Oh, okay. Uh, so the next question is by Upasna, whose question we could not take in the previous session. Uh, it's, uh, she asks whether with an open border, uh, uh, with an open border that Sweden shares with other Scandinavian countries, does this have an effect on its immigration policies? Yes, uh, Sweden and other Scandinavian countries, they have no agreements. Uh, any national from each, you know, political entity freely can just, uh, uh, you know, uh, cross the border and come to Sweden or from Sweden go to Finland or Norway, just start uh, uh, leaving there. But uh, uh, these not implemented, okay, now is, is the same for it uh, because Sweden is a member of the European Union. 
So uh, this is equal for uh, 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 other, you know, people coming from other uh, European Union countries. So of course, but it's facilitated. Sweden at, the, at, that, at that time was uh, an expansion, but both Finland and no no Norway suffered from huge, you know, economic problems. And uh, the level of unemployment, I remember in Finland, was more than 18%. And uh, Norway, before became a kind of so advanced uh, industrially, or maybe in terms of oil production and increasing the standard level of, of living of people, also are really dependent on Sweden. So we had plenty of immigrants from both country and Sweden, but successfully they moved back uh, yes, following the, the increasing of economic and socioeconomic condition in their native countries. Right, right. So the next question is by Shantan. He asks you uh, whether, whether you think that immigration can be used as a potential tool to combat the demographic challenges of an aging population facing Sweden? So, you know, the recent, you know, those uh, Sweden received more than uh, 200,000 between 2014 and 15. And I, 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 okay, Sweden is a very good nation. I'm a Swedish citizen. But actually, this is not a human conviction because of that. Sweden is an aging country. And those who came now, I see around those from Syria. Most of them, they are engineers, they are in, in different, you know, working. And even after two, three years, I see students that are studying biomedicine. Me I don't know very, very. So they have uh, those people, Sweden invested zero krona on them. They are young people, they came with their education. So already this is a great gain for Sweden, both demographically and economically. So they can uh, just feel plenty of empty places for those people. And even it created a kind of put more dynamic in a kind of uh, uh, market which uh, suffered in some places, remote places in Sweden of stagnation. So suddenly it becomes more dynamic and we see, for example, the movement of people. So of course, I see plenty of positive and dynamics as well from, from those groups and uh, we, we, we are aging. So we need people and we need children uh, who we will take care of people here almost never die. They just, uh, you see, they are 90, hundreds, and OK, they need support. So those uh, children now, they are seven, eight years. In 10 or uh, 12 years, they are 20, 22. So they are going to work in, in, in right. that Yeah. Uh, that also answers, I think, part of uh, Swakshadeep's question. But I'll just take this question from Akanksha, who has put uh, a very interesting, she's pointed out something really interesting. Uh, so she's asking whether amidst the raising uh, xenophobic sentiments and recent violence against immigrants in Sweden, how are the younger migrant, pop how is the younger migrant population dealing with constant discrimination and bullying in the spheres of institutions and workplaces? Very nice question, very, very clearly formulated. You know, should I, uh, I need to admit that there is a kind of overrepresentation in the criminality just taken from, from uh, young people with immigrant background. Why? Because they are from socioeconomically excluded areas. There is no uh, Swedish young people in those areas. So, uh, 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 this is natural and normal when the criminality is increasing there because there is no Swedish people, only those immigrants. But actually, I think um, this is more difficult. Uh, I, arrived to Sweden as, a, as an adult. So I came here for just starting. It's much more difficult for younger generation who was who born in, 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 in Sweden because they feel it maybe at the, I need them, not only in terms of research, in terms of sharing common sentiments and feeling with each other. I see those young people, some of them, they come to me and they cry. They see, I don't feel that actually I belong to that society. I need to leave just as kind of suffocating me. So I actually, I have witnessed plenty of such, you know, evidences or witnesses from different, you know, students from the university with immigrant spectrum. Actually, the, the society, there is a kind of tacit, uh, you know, model. You don't understand, no one says that you, you are not welcome. 
but no one does know. There is no signs of social integration. So it is very, very major cause. Of course, I agree with, 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 with the question, very nicely formulated and it's true. Yeah. And, and on that note, uh, there's this question by Arjun who asks you, which would be like probing a little deeper into the discussion that you're already having. Uh, whether So he asks that although Sweden is considered one of the more secular states in the world, could religion play a role in strengthening the us versus them binary? Yes, uh, actually for me, religion can never be excluded from those secular institutions in any places. I believe in uh, Max Weber and Max Weber, he outlined uh, not, for example, it is not in a kind of positivist, posit positivistic or rational way when politics uh, is arriving, so religion is excluded. There is a kind of continuous interaction between religion and, and, and uh, secularism. So those secular, Swedish secular institutions, they are acting religiously vis-a-vis -vis those religions uh, which are considered not compatible with the, with the, with the uh, dominant culture. And of course, but two days, we, uh, today, nowadays, we have increasing Islamophobia in, in Sweden and in many other uh, countries in, around the world and in, 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 around Europe uh, and even neighboring countries like Denmark and Finland and Norway. So actually, so uh, this is not because those people who are considered are coming from non-compatible or more uh, co distance culture or religion, but because for me, uh, Swedish, this is this a part of, of embedded or rooted in the systematically in the Swedish institution. So actually they are secular, but they act religiously or they act as Christians vis-a-vis -vis non christians So, uh, true yes yes sir so uh, while we have had uh, questions uh, relating to what are the policies that sweden is using to integrate the immigrant population there's also a question uh, by vertica which uh, which asks like uh, she says that i would like to know your take on how migrants can try to assimilate or integrate themselves more in Sweden. Do you think that the migrant groups can do more to integrate themselves or is it the selective exclusion or, or the selective exclusion only comes from the state? What are your views? You know, it's very, very good question, this one too. You know, you know, inclusion and exclusion is not a kind of mechanical, you know, model that you can see uh, uh, whether or not is not a kind of uh, black and white. It, uh, it is a process. So it is in doing, in progressing all the time, uh, and it's happening. And at the same time, I saw, uh, I showed you, for example, the picture uh, or about uh, exclusion and the ethnic boundaries. At the same time, you, you saw plenty of progress, uh, you know, uh, uh, examples of progress uh, for immigrant people of immigrant and refugee backgrounds. So they are going and doing parallel or mixed in the same process. But one more thing is very important to address. For me, uh, the project of assimilation is failed since many, many, many years. So actually, if Sweden, the state, which I think they kind of tacitly follow the policy of assimilation, but the groups, they create their own alternative to the Swedish assimilation. So they have social media, they have their TV stations, they have their cultural activities, they have their, uh, you know, create, uh, find possibility for publication, uh, publishing books for children. Actually, so assimilation is already failed. If the Swedish states insist on following the assimilation policy is wrong for me. What is the alternative? Is the recognition as uh, Will Kim Lika, that philosopher or political scientist from Canada uh, claims, uh, recognition, institutional and legal recognition of those uh, different culture and including them in the understand, you know, in the main, uh, main uh, national identity. So actually assimilation, it doesn't work. But integration should be followed by, according to me, 
a clear recognition of, of differences. For example, today, the Arabic language is a second large uh, Swedish after, after Swedish language. So for me, it's not only a language, it's about a huge possibility for Sweden to just present itself in the sphere of diplomatic and international activities in business using them. But there is no science in addressing those issues. So Arabic culture and Arabic language is representing a huge uh, a great, uh, part of population, but for me is not addressed clearly. And even we talk about um, education of mother tongue. Believe me that education of mother tongue was for two hours and it becoming more than more, you know, uh, they uh, follow this authenticity. Now is not even, 45 minutes in a week for a kid. And uh, in many cases and situation, so they say, oh, there is no teacher, the distances between school is quite out and the kids, they don't like to follow that. And they abolish it, they remove it. So actually there is an activity to reduce the possibility of cultural representation of people who are refugee and immigrants by going into public spaces. But there is not a solution because they create, they are dynamic people. They create their own possibility as I can, for example, actually I improve my Kurdish in Sweden. When I, before I arrived to Sweden, I didn't know any Kurdish because that language is forbidden in Iran and Turkey and others. So actually I learn Kurdish in Sweden and I learn also contacts with plenty of people, including those wonderful people from India and the surrounding areas in Sweden. So Sweden is a kind of global platform for meeting, but I hope the mainstream culture and the state uh, can understand this and address those very uh, positive aspects. Thank you so much, Dr. Kayati. Yes. It was brilliant hearing you talk about all the issues that you've touched upon today. And I'll not take up more time. We have already crossed our limit and I'll pass it on to the director of the Nordic Center in India, uh, Christabel, who will like to say a vote of thanks to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. On behalf of the Nordic Center and on behalf of Professor Basmati and her entire team at the Center for European Studies at JNU, many, many thanks to you, Professor Khyati. Many, many thanks to our member university, Lin Shuping. This was a fascinating lecture in so many ways and a very fascinating yes. discussion as well. And I'm very grateful to you. I also know that you had to juggle your schedule to accommodate us. And I, and I hope then that this was an intellectually fulfilling exercise for you. This is the last lecture thank of the you day. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christabel, that you had that nice communication <laughs> with me. I really appreciate your tolerance vis a vis because I'm not answering sometimes because I have no answer to you. And finally, you say, okay, but I cannot 21. But the, the summer school is lasted only during those days. What should we do? So I actually, I removed one activity from my program to, for you and thank you so much. So any of you, if you now want to know more about my university, because I'm at the same time responsible for the international you know, contacts from my institution, my department to outside. So you're welcome to contact me. Professor. Thank you so much, Professor Khayati. Thank you so much. I have raised my hand when you said if you want to con be contacted. So I have, I have raised my hand. I will be in touch with you. You are welcome uh, as Kurdish people on my head and my eyes. <laughs> That's so nice. <laughs> I will be really honored. I'm very happy to receive a contact from you, Professor Serka. Thank and you. Thank you so much. I will be, uh, you know, sort of carry this conversation forward. I'll mail you and send you a so mail. Thank you so much. Take care of you. And very you also careful, take please, care. please, for that COVID and pandemic is not nice time and India is suffering right now. Please yes. be careful. You are my you favorite. <laughs> I prefer 100 times you than the, the other big neighbor nation. So please be <laughs> in very good health condition, okay? <laughs> okay, you too take care. Bye-bye, nice meeting you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night, Bye -bye. everyone. Thank you for the wonderful session, Merci. Professor Kathy. Thank you so much. Thank Goodbye. you, thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>
bye 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 thank you bye, see sir. you all see you all tomorrow same time yes bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.